And I've got uh, got my co-host waving at me. So let's uh, let's get them in. There you go. Are, we, are you with me, Simone? Ah, I can see you now. <laughs> Good afternoon, Simone. Good afternoon, Rohan. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. I'm very well. Just come back from a nice lunch. Had a Excellent. Wonderful walk. So it's a good Saturday so far. How about you? Yeah, mine hasn't been too stressful either, so that's good. <laughs> well, it's, it's a nice, gentle start to the, the start of the year, which is nice. And we've got uh, got lots of lovely people joining us to talk Fantastic. about medical school interviews. So um, it's probably a good time to introduce ourselves uh, for those of us who uh, somehow don't know who you and I are. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'll let you go first. So I'm a lead consultant here at Uni Admissions. My name's Simone Stewart, and it's wonderful to see you all here joining us. So thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Rohan Agarwal. So I'm the founder of the company, and I look after our consulting team with Simone and make sure that our student success rates continue to improve year on year. So Simone, what what have we got in store for us? I mean, it looks like quite quite a lot to do with with medics today, right? Absolutely. So um, everything medical interviews, what you can expect, um, how to go about them, you know, the pros, the cons and everything in between. Yeah, absolutely. So it's going to be a very, we like to keep things as interactive and lighthearted as possible. So if people do have questions, please do fire them in either into the chat and Q&A. And hopefully we'll get through a lot of them just in the presentation itself. But in case we don't, we will have a Q&A section at the end. Um, so I guess let's just let's just dive right into it, right, Simone? Yes, let's do it. Um, so we're going to start off by talking a little bit about what's going on with the BMAT, uh, and then focus more about the interview and what the what the admissions tutors are typically looking for. <clears throat> now, um, the BMAT is a, is obviously a test required by some very competitive medical admissions uh, schools like Oxford, Cambridge, UCL, Imperial, um, Leeds, and so on, and it's been running for a very long time. Actually, I don't know if I told you something. I actually, when I did the BMAT, I actually, when I applied to university, I took the BMAT a long time ago and it makes me feel very old. <laughs> <laughs> not um, too old, very hard, not too old. Yeah, and and I ended up, so when I went to Gonville and Keys, I ended up being supervised. So my, my main tutor for neurology was, was the late Roger Carpenter. And he's probably the cleverest man I've ever had the pleasure of meeting. Wow. And it, it turned out he's the, the, the kind of author of the BMAT. So he was the one who actually wrote this test. That's amazing. So I, I, yeah, so I, I had no idea, but actually I just felt so privileged being able to be taught by him for That's incredible. a year or so. Uh, but it all makes sense. So yes, the, this is a very, very difficult test and obviously it's designed to stretch the, the most able students. And historically it's, it's always been on paper, but for the last two years running, they've uh, they decided to make it online. I, I wonder why they did that. <laughs> uh, and obviously the, the counterpart of the BMAT, the, the UCO, has been online so we thought actually things would go reasonably well and this is what it was like the last time it was um done on paper and, and you kind of see a really nice gaussian normal distribution or almost normal distribution so at the lower end it's you know not many people getting ones at the high end there's almost a vanishing number of people getting full marks and eight to nines and the majority of people kind of get clumped toward this four and a half five-ish area is that I think that that's broadly what you'd expect and you know obviously we've talked about this quite a lot of Simone of how this was like the standard of what the test used to look like yeah. and then this is what happened um last year you can see it. it does look very different doesn't it <laughs> and what, what I find quite interesting about this is it's actually I mean the, the overall shape is similar right like it's still a, still a not nice and normal kind of bell-shaped distribution but You've got these strange two peaks here, and I find it quite hard to explain that. Um, in, in, you know, in fact, this is kind of where we'd expect them to be. And if we kind of overlay the 2019 in grey and the 2021 in blue, you, you can see there's a big discrepancy, right? Yeah. And do, do, 
any I'm gonna put you on the spot here and see oh <laughs> don't <laughs> any any crazy ideas I'm sure some of the the audience as it were may have may have some understanding of it, but any any kind of guesses as to what, what might be going on potentially um Well, I'll go. Sure, I'll give you. A, sure. I'll yeah, give, give me a clue. I'll, I'll give you a clue here Thanks. because it's a it's a very tr tricky question, and I think very few people have the answer to this. Which is, I think there was obviously a lot of issues that went on with the BMAT in two years ago. Where, um, so when we did a survey, I think more than half of students had some issues with their online tests, and I think you probably spoke to a lot of students and parents last yeah. year. You know, some, were, I think, when I spoke to them two years ago, they were almost in tears at how bad. Yeah. Think things have gone in the test centres. I mean, can you give us some examples of what happened? With, with yeah, with... some people just um, couldn't access the paper. Some people had those technical issues where the paper just stopped like midway, so they weren't able to answer those questions. Yeah. All sorts of things were were happening, and it was just very difficult to mitigate those circumstances because you know they were just happening as and when, and um, you know sometimes they were like the invigilators weren't even around to, to speak mm -hmm. to so it was difficult to attest to what was happening so just a plethora of you know really unfortunate circumstances for students it was wasn't it and I think it was heartbreaking for both of us when we were listening to students who've been working so hard for so many so many like months yeah but then suddenly you know despite how long and how many how much hard work they've done it's kind of almost a random number generator their score at the end mm. of it it's just such a big shame <clears throat> But, you know, we, we expected that the scores would be a bit odd. And I think this is just demonstrating that in a, in a kind of more empirical setting. Um, so, so if I just take us take you back to, to, to this one, you know, we'd, we'd expect this to be a nice, smooth curve. Yeah. But it wasn't. And, I, and I, obviously, we will never really know the answer to this. Um, but it feels like it's likely to be the fact that we've got one peak here for the students who weren't disadvantaged, i.e. had a smooth test, and then another peak for the students who were kind of disadvantaged, either from technical perspective or, I mean, there were some students who started the test three or four hours late. There were some who couldn't even see graphs or images. I mean, that, that's atrocious. In yeah, my, in my really bad, yeah. And, and I think, obviously, the Cambridge Admissions Testing Service has a big responsibility because they have to, you know, invigilate a test for, 10 or more than 10,000 people, right? But this is the second year they had to do this. So we would have expected it to go better, but I don't think it did. I think it, it went probably <laughs> equally as bad based on, <laughs> if, not, if not worse, based on yeah. some of the twists that we saw. Yeah, there's no improvement. Hmm. Which, which, is, which is a shame, right? But what, what this means is of course, the BMAT is less reliable um, than, than, it, than it used to be. I mean, do you think that'll have an impact on kind of interviews? Yeah, I think potentially, you know, the onus will lie, you know, more squarely on the interviews because yeah. it's, it's something that's more manageable at this stage in the application process. So I think that's yeah, a great discussion. And, and each, each university is going to treat the BMAP results very differently, aren't they? So um, I, I remember, like, I think it was two years ago, Cambridge made some students sit the NSAA, which you remember is the, the natural sciences test, and they made them yeah. sit the NSAA. So some students turned up and... You know, a couple of them haven't even been told us and suddenly they're presented with a new admissions test to sit. Um, Imperial made students sit the, you, you know where there's a February BMA, and they made them sit the February BMA again, so, so that every university handled it differently. And we're still yeah. kind of, news is still filtering through about how each university is standardising. But it's a, it's a nightmare for everyone, right? Like, as parents are unhappy, the admissions testing service is pretty unhappy because they're getting lots of complaints. Um, the universities are very unhappy because... They can't use a very important piece of information. Which yeah. yeah. Um, but but it's, it's just a real shame, isn't it? Um, wish we could have. Uh, hopefully, they'll go back to paper paper format this year. Let's see. Yeah. So so here's um here's a quick graph. Uh, so all these slides are put together by our uh, head head of research, uh, Matt Elliot, and you, you can see this is the the standard BMAT Section One scores known on 2019. So the, the first line from, from the left shows the average score. Um, so that's pretty much four and a half. And then the, the, the one on the right, just to uh, about two bars across, is the UCL average applicant score. And UCL is you know, a fantastic medical school I've to as well. And on the right is the, the kind of key thing 
which is the the average offer holder. So often students will say, well, you know, I've got a, I'm applying to UCL, I've got the average UCL or I've got the average Cambridge offer, the uh, average Cambridge applicant, but it's not the applicant. Yeah. It's what the people who end up getting the offer and that's what the BMA score is reflected. So the interesting thing I find here is each of these uh, bars represents a the number of questions you got right. So if we look towards the very left, there's a, there's a little bit um, on the, let me just see if I can do this actually. You can see this little doohickey here. Um, yeah. That's That basically shows the number of students who got one question correct. Okay. And then on here on this side will be the number of students who got, uh, what's it, 30, 35 questions or 30, 33 questions correct, right? And each of these bars is, so for instance, the third bar along, you got three correct and, and so on and so on. What I find quite interesting is um, the number here, and if you look at the difference between the average score, so this bar here, mm -hmm. and then this bar, and if we count the number of bars between them, so it's actually one, two, three, four, five, there's just extra five questions that you had to get right in this test in order to go from average yeah, exactly. to someone who could be an average offer holder. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes I think people people forget that, right? Like they, they think that they have to get 90% in the test. And it's just, I mean, this graph demonstrates it really beautifully that it's it's almost, it's very far from that itself. Yeah, yeah. It's the margins, isn't it? I think you can underestimate the power of the margins. Exactly, yeah. And every question you get right moves you much closer. So just a difference of five questions would move you from average to a UCL um, average offer hold territory. Another five would put you in the top, you know, ten percent. So when we work with students, often it's not really just um, trying to improve them by fifty percent. It's just trying to give them a few extra marks. And actually, it's, a lot of the time that can either be we can do that pretty quickly, uh, but to improve them from you know, but it's like trying to go in when you, when you do GCSE. It's trying to go from a A to an A star is actually relatively straightforward. Trying to go from a C to an A star is much harder. Yeah, and therefore takes much longer as well. Um, so I, I just I just find that graph really really interesting. It is interesting. So, so, so what do you think might potentially happen then with, with interviews based on what we've been talking? I mean, we'll talk a little bit about the, the interview itself, but any, any kind of predictions or anything that you know based on what you've seen like might be happening? Maybe students are going to maybe more students are going to get invited or less, um, or we just don't know right now. Yeah, it's, it's it's difficult to say, but I think definitely they will be inclined to rely on the interviews. Yeah. more at this stage yeah. because it's you know it's something tangible as I said that has been manageable as opposed to this which has been a, a fluid situation full of um you know issues and um it's it's hard to kind of measure those um results mm. it's really mm. difficult yeah it is and you know, often I think students and parents get a little bit annoyed because they say well why do we have to go through so many hoops why can't we just submit our UCAS form, like, you know, we, I had one parent who was applying for economics, or, or the, their child, the child was applying for economics, sorry, uh, LSE, and they said, you know, this is a very competitive university, and all they asked for is just a personal statement, why does, why do Oxford, Cambridge, why do all these medical schools want two tests and an interview, it's just so much work, but I actually think I, if I was applying again, I would want even more tests and more interviews, because I think it would give me the chance to shine, whereas if you're just writing a a short essay it's just so yeah. hard to stand out um the flip side of that is now of course if you work hard for months on the test and then the test doesn't count for anything then it's uh you're pretty you're pretty annoyed yeah um, and at no fault of your own if it's just something exactly right. out I mean, of your control on the day we had a uh, i had one parent the day after the test i think it was actually just the day of the, the second day they were running the test and she was you know she was really really angry bless her and I think she was very frustrated. Obviously, she thought we were the admissions testing body. <laughs> so, and and you know, credit to her. She, she when she when she when I told her that we're not actually responsible for administering the test, we'd love to be. I think we'd do a really good job. Um, but but she, that just tells you the level of frustration. Because these are these are key life decisions that yeah. people are making around. They, they're obviously it's their kids' future, so they get very passionate about these topics and, and understandably so especially when there's the stakes are so high Absolutely. so if you are in a, in that cohort um, please tell us a little bit about your experiences what they were like um, did you have a good 
clean BMATs uh, or did you have any issues? If so, you know, obviously our heart goes up and, and bleeds for you, but there's obviously a limited amount we can do right now. Um, the universities have said they're not going to be a reset. Um, so I suppose now we should probably talk move on to the, the interview itself and the, and, you know, and as, as Simone, you mentioned, this is a thing that's going to really stand, set students apart. Um, when we talk about the 2023, 2024 entry students, we often talk about the pie chart, right? And the, and the kind of constituents of it. I don't think we've actually got this in here, but just for the audience, would you mind kind of just going through like what, what, what the importance of that is and just talking them through it? Yeah, no, absolutely. When we're referring to the pie chart, it's basically the breakdown of the different application hurdles. So everybody knows that you need to submit a personal statement. It's, uh, it gets a lot of press, the personal statement, but actually, um, it only accounts for 10% of the overall outcome. So it's important, you know, it's your introduction to the university to present yourself in a particular way. So yeah, definitely it's the foundation, but it can only account for 10%, okay? Um, so then moving on, you've got the next 30%, which is focusing in on your A-levels and your GCSE results. So the last four years of your academics, they look at that and they attribute 30% of the overall decision based on your academics. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, then it's the admissions tests and they also account for 30%. So, you know, the universities look at that as very, very important. Um, and that takes us up to the 70% marker. Mm -hmm. The remaining 30% is the interview. So you can see now in terms of when you're preparing, you want to allocate the right amount of weight for each application hurdle. Um, so we know that students really toil over the personal statement and we agree it needs to be of a particular standard. Um, but, you, you know, there's no point in making your personal statement amazing and then not doing enough work on your admissions tests or your interviews, for instance. Um, so your interviews are really important. Look, they're the last part of the application hurdle. And um, so then your last chance to influence the outcome. So I think because they're that bookmark, you do need to pay particular attention to them. And we know experientially they can be tricky and um, mm. they can be nuanced. So um, we're going to get into that because, you know, 30% is at stake. Yeah, and I think... That, that's a really good summary. And I think that the other thing to, to mention here is that obviously every medical school is slightly different. Yeah. So um, some medical schools, there may not be 30%, it may be 40%, maybe 20%, given that the test will probably count for less now, especially if you're applying to a DMAT university. Yeah. Then, and, and you know, GCSEs will have less of an impact as well because of well, teacher chess grades and so on. It, it still means that the interview is actually more important than it probably has been for a very long time. And, but, but at the same time, I think if you have got an interview coming up, you, you should almost be a bit reassured that they clearly liked you. Yeah. And you know, very few, I can't think of a single medical school that would invite you to interview just to, you know, just for the hell of it. Like if they invite you, they, that means they're seriously considering you as an applicant. Right? Um, and then of course, that needs to be taken seriously. Now, um, we'll obviously talk a little bit about the interview itself, Simone, but probably the, the thing that kind of um, worries me the most is when, when, when I'm speaking to parents and students is when they say, how much prep have you done? And they say, well, not very much. I'm like, okay, when are you going to start doing it? And I say, well, we're going to wait for the interviews to come through and then we'll start preparing. For, and then now, I often get very passionate and agitated about this. I'm going to let you tell everyone why that's a terrible idea. <laughs> so if, if you're listening today and if you remember nothing at all, please, please. remember what Simone is going to tell you next. Please do. This is, this is vital. Um, so generally, universities usually give about five days notice on average. However, um, you know, recently it's been even less than that. So I had a parent who contacted us and they were extremely panicked because actually they had been given 24 hours notice, just 24 hours to prepare for this interview that could be 30, 40%. So it's not enough time. Five days is not enough time. A week is not enough time. 
two weeks is not enough time. So yeah. you can't you can't wait. That's what I'm saying. Don't wait until you get that invite. Don't do yeah. that. Yeah. Prepare. Prepare while you have the time and the space to do that. Yeah. Now I'm sure some 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 of the audience are probably thinking, well, why would I prepare? That's such a waste of time if I don't get an interview. Well, what would you say to them? Would you <laughs> We do not want to be prepared in case you get the interview as opposed to the other way around. You get the invite and you're completely unprepared and there's nothing you can do about it at that stage. You don't want to be in that predicament when it's yeah. completely avoidable. It's just... Yeah, and I think people people have this tendency to treat exams very differently to the way they treat interviews. But in my experience, interviews are very much just an exam like any exam they can and should be prepared for and if you don't prepare for an interview then you almost don't deserve that place and, and, and i don't mean that in like a like a mean way but you know, there will be students out there who have been preparing for these things for months and months and months so it just won't be a it, 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 when you go to an interview and you've not even got understanding of key questions like why medicine why this university um why not nursing, et cetera. The, the basic stuff that you're going to get asked, if you haven't got questions and solutions prepared for them, then it's, it's like walking into a math test never having opened a textbook. It just, it's not going to go well. Yeah. So I, I've tried very hard not to, not to get too passionate there about this. But, um, yes, if you are listening, we both stress very importantly that if you learn nothing from today at all, it is please start preparing for your medical school interviews. Now, if you're very unfortunate and very unlucky, you may not get any medical school interview invites, and then you have a decision to make as to whether you reapply. But even if you choose not to, those skills are soft skills, and like any soft skills, they take a long period of time to, to develop and improve, and they stay with you for a long time. And the, the reason why Simone's work very well spoken isn't just by chance, and I'm sure you've spent months and years kind of developing the, the ability to kind of come across very nicely, as do, you know, people in, in media and journalism, for, for instance. And, and it's exactly the same as whenever you're going into an interview, that's the type of personality you need to be projecting. Um, okay, I should probably move on, about I'll carry on talking. <laughs> so tell, tell us a little bit about you know, when, when someone's walking in and, and, and think they've got an interview potentially coming up, broadly, what kind of things are the interviews like? Um, well, it, it could be a number of things. You know, you could have um, just one person or a couple of people. Mm -hmm. um, conversely, you could have um, a whole panel mm -hmm. or you could have um, like an MMI where you've got lots of different stations. So, you know, more people. Um, the thing is, you know, that with each and every presentation, you do not need to be daunted because if you know what can come up, then you're able to prepare for each eventuality. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, the more prepared you are, the more confident and comfortable you're going to feel. So even if you walk into a virtual room, whatever you face, the thing is you should have faced that already before in your preparation time. And so it won't take you by surprise. So we're taking the risk out. We're going to prepare you. You're going to be absolutely fine. Yeah. And this slide's, I think, getting at a very, very important thing that you kind of alluded to, which is the interviews are very fairly regimented so I think gone are the days when they when you'd walk into a room and they'd like shout at you something like tell me about your subject and then I can't just sit still for about 20 minutes and you watch you squirm they're very very much structured now so um the, there's obviously various types of them but of, often they'll have um set preset number of questions asked, asked by certain interviewers and they may have one or two follow-up questions for them and then there's a very strict regimented marking criteria in place instead so the, the, they're not used they're not like what you, you may hear in the newspapers anymore There's, there are there is a lot of science and method behind what initially appears like just random questions being asked um okay um let's see here so, so we've talked I, I keep talking about these soft skills um i mean what does, what does that mean like, you know, in, in practice um well i think it alludes to the fact that um, a soft skill is something that needs to be, as you said, developed over time, nurtured, cultivated. Mm -hmm. And the way to do that is through the practice and the outworking of it. So it's a different approach to, you know, an admissions test where, like you said, you open up a textbook, you read, you know, through what it says, you work out the solutions. It's slightly different. You need to actually 
be doing it. You need to be engaging with the subject. You need to um, be receiving feedback. You need to go back over that material. So it's it's a very different approach that um, is needed and it has to be employed over a period of time would be um, would be what I would say with regards to that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so, you know, we, we put here that actually it's all about, the, the soft skills are all about the, the things that perhaps you wouldn't see on a, on a school report card. I mean, you may see a grade for biology or chemistry or um, English, but you, you would probably wouldn't potentially, uh, maybe now in some of the more modern schools, but historically I never got a report card which said communication A and adaptability A and, and like they're, they're just, weren't, but they're really important skills and they take a long time to develop, right? Um, I think interviewing is really hard in general. I mean, when I first went to my, my, my interview at King's, I found it really quite challenging just preparing for them because I remember I'd, I'd give a, I gave one of the textbooks or a list of questions to my dad and said, ask me these questions. And in my head, I knew vaguely what to say, but actually being able to formulate that in a, in a clear, coherent manner is, is quite a challenge. Yeah. Um, and, and this is what we're talking about is metacognition. It's thinking about how you're thinking and then also the ability to present your ideas. So um, it's the same as journalism, whenever someone asks you a question, what's the best way, when I do make an answer, when I do answer a question, how does it come across? Does it come across positively, negatively? How could it be perceived? And those things just take a lot of practice, unfortunately. They do. <laughs> um, okay, so so here's a, here's a little fun thing um, we've got, which is, kind of examples of hard versus soft skills. Um, so we've got Excel versus PowerPoint, reading versus writing, knowing versus teaching ability versus leadership. I mean, what, what do you think of these kind of um, skills? I mean, are, are there particularly skills that you think actually these are soft versus hard or do you think there's a bit of overlap between them? Yeah, I think by and large, they represent what we're trying to express quite well. Um, I think there there is slight overlap with for instance mm. reading and writing um, in yeah. fact you know um knowing versus teaching and ability versus leadership I would say that there is a slight overlap um but I understand why they were chosen and I think that they do communicate what we're trying to say quite well what mm. do you think yeah like some of these make a lot of sense right like excel you either know how to do a formula or you don't Whereas PowerPoint is much more about how to use the slides, like, like we are right now, I suppose. Exactly. And hopefully engaging the audience and kind of presenting information in a, <clears throat> in a useful manner. Um, so it's one thing to actually create the PowerPoint, but it's another thing to use that to present a, present a case or, or engaging information. And then the same with, I think the knowing and teaching is really important because I don't know if you found this, but in my experience, the best teachers aren't necessarily Oxbridge professors or Oxbridge dons sometimes they if, if they're working at such a high academic level they almost find it very much impossible to understand why someone what doesn't get some, yeah exactly because it's just so obvious to them right and um, whereas because they've, they've grown up with their life and just very bright individuals they know the answer to something is is that and they're like oh it's obvious mm. and but unless you can prepare, and it's not it's obviously not just Oxbridge you know, it's the same with like a piano teacher right like uh, I used to have one piano teacher who would uh, kind of, uh, he would often just be like, just do this. And he would like play this piece perfectly and then just expect me to be able to follow the fun. And it was, he was a great pianist, but probably not the, not the best teacher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we've got a little bit of interview criteria um, here that we were kind of discussing. Um, I, I mean, bef before we kind of go on to, interview criteria itself if we think broadly about what medical what medical schools are looking for in, in interviews what would you kind of say are the top few things is there anything in particular that will stand out for you yeah I would say um you know a balance between um being able to make those harder decisions but also with the sensitivity that's needful so you know there are going to be instances where a firm approach is, is needed um, but it might be it probably will be um, at the risk of you know somebody feeling emotional as, as a result of that information or you know somebody having to make a really difficult decision you know about about a particular surgery or something like that so that balance between you know 
um, offering that information and being able to do so so that it's palatable and so that it can be received well by the recipient. I would think that, you know, that's a, a skill that they'd be looking for. That clarity of, of thought and expression, um, those two would be the top. Um, also, the ability to pause, reflect, analyze and see what's necessary in a moment um, as well. So those three would probably be the main things. Yeah, and I guess the other, the other thing is just, uh, you know, you, you've alluded to the communication and the, the reasoning and the application. It's just a hunger or a desire to study their subject um, at that university. You know, we've talked a lot about medical school, but I appreciate obviously some students may still have interviews coming up for other subjects, particularly Oxford and Cambridge. Regardless of what you're being interviewed for, if you're not, if you don't come across as passionately interested and motivated for your subject, then everything else is kind of irrelevant to a certain. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I can, I can come across, and you and I could probably go to an interview for, I don't know, um, biomedical. Well, no, we're not biomedical. Um, history of history of art, for instance, and you. Um, I don't particularly have a big <laughs> interest in history of art. I don't know about you, but. We could probably talk a decent game, but if we weren't motivated for it, yeah, then, then I think the admissions tutors would see through that. I mean, it's, it's, it's very much that. So, regardless of how how well you present yourself, the first thing that has to come across is that motivation and hunger to do the subject you are going to be doing for many, many years, if not the rest of your life. Mm. Um, okay. So, so, so man, you talked about MMI for a bit earlier. Can you just take the audience through what, what these are? I mean, hopefully you'll be relatively familiar with them, but just talk us through the structure and what, what someone should expect going into one. So you have a number of stations and um, you are kind of going through these stations quite quickly and you're asked to do different things at different stations effectively. Um, so, you know, it could be a role play situation. I think a lot of students hear that word and they're like, role play? No, <laughs> um, but I think it's um, it's a cool way of of you know kind of putting you um, in that situation. Yes, under the spotlight, but you know seeing how you deal and manage with 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 those situations and with that level of stress. Um, so you know we've got a list here: um, professional judgment, prioritization, giving instructions, data analysis, problem based learning. So it covers a range of things. Mm -hmm. um, so you're expected to, you know, to know a lot and to express how much you know, because, um, you know, 10 stations, that's significant, isn't it? So each station... It is, yeah. And yeah, it can be quite tiring as well, right? I mean, so there's the reason, that they're called multiple mini interviews, but actually when I was a med student and he was a doctor, the exams we had to kind of get to the next stage of our career were called OSCEs. Okay. And, and it's, 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 it's O-S-C-E. And they essentially stand for observed simulated clinical encounter, I think. And they were basically MMIs. So we would have um, anywhere between five to 15 stations of four to 15 minutes each station. And you kind of just go do a circuit. And it was it was really exhausting um, to the extent where I think they used to build in. You'd have a break station where essentially you just knew you're doing nothing for five to 10 minutes, which is quite nice. You need that. Um, yeah. <laughs> my, long time. Uh, it is. My, my med school would uh, actually sometimes, they were feeling really nice about it. They would, they would leave tea and cookies on, on that, so you kind of have a little break. So, you know, there, there, there were some perks to having an exam. <laughs> um, but but this, is, this is really standard now in medical schools throughout, right? And so the role play, I think you said, is really important is because if they'll be act, um, working with actors, and if they can't work with them properly, then... At, at, at junior level there's no way they'll be able to do that with patients in real life is that that's the way we kind of teach junior doctors and how to handle some particularly challenging patients um data analysis is typically they'll give you a graph and then you'll have to answer questions for it but the one thing i often have to remind students is don't expect an interviewer at every single station which i, I know sounds really odd but sometimes people get confused that they just go to a station and it's just like a piece of paper telling them what to do and then that's it and then they have to put their answer into like a big box um don't don't be kind of perturbed by that that is that is normal so don't expect like a human interviewer at every single station um why why do you think someone that they do that i mean what shouldn't it wouldn't it be much easier for them just to 
have one interview for 20 minutes or an hour rather than like 10 different interviews? Well, I think, you know, within the role, actually, as a doctor, you're going to be interacting with many, many different people on many different levels for many different reasons. So this is a good simulation of that experience in itself. Yeah, and the other thing is, of course, it reduces bias. So let's say you walk into a to an interview room and actually you just really don't have good chemistry with the interview or you say something really bad at the start and you kind of get off onto a very bad footing. Yeah. These kind of allow you to have a fresh restart at the end of every station, which I think is really helpful, actually. Because, um, so, so, you know, yes, you, you may have bombed one station, but at least you can still make it up in all the others where I think it's quite hard to come back from like a, if you have a disastrous start in one interview, it's quite difficult to mentally come back from that. Exactly, to just shake it off and yeah, start yeah. over, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so here's, a, here's, here's some example questions um, that come up in the past. So these are all taken from um, essentially a, a book of questions that were created by our, some of our students. And each of these has a particular base in mind. So the one I often ask the students is, so Simone, I often ask students, why medicine? And the, the responses will you know, invariably be something like, I like people and I like science. And then the follow-up question to that as well, if you like science so much, why don't you become a researcher? Or if you like helping people so much, why don't you become a nurse? And you'll be amazed by the number of people, students are like, oh yeah, nurses are okay, but I want to be a doctor because doctors do like good stuff. Or, <laughs> and it's, you know, it's that level of, obviously each of these questions have traps that you can fall into. And unless you're aware of them, you can come across as insulting a nurse, for instance. Yeah, given the fact that some panels have nurses on them, that's, wow. not, that's not a good no, thing. No, you don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is, it. there's one here, which is, do you think nurses are important? I mean, obviously the answer is yes, because the NHS would crumble without them. But just how to articulate that without coming across as like, you're, you're a nursing, big nursing fan and just want to be a nurse. So there's a fine balance between, between both of them. Yeah. Um, and, and a few of these other ones, I think, have to be handled with, with, with a little bit of caution as well. So that, that second one, Simon, the, the one, you're a junior doctor on the colorectal surgery and you, your consultant turns up smelling of alcohol. I ask that to students quite a lot. What do you think, like, the most common response is? When, when um, I send them home, basically. Yeah, and you'd be amazed. You know, that is the most common response I, I get from students. Actually, what medical schools want to see is well, I mean, if this happened in real life, right? Like if, if your boss turned up drunk, you, uh, you know, even if it's the NHS, but pretty much anywhere, you wouldn't just straight away send them home. Like, you, like you'd probably want to know a bit more information to find out. But unless you've been trained and have an understanding of how to approach these questions, it's really easy to fall into traps, it's particularly in the NHS. So, for instance, if your consultant has does smell of alcohol, it might be that they've used hand sanitizer which smells of alcohol, or someone vomited on them with. There could be a lot of reasons why right. someone, but unless you do the research rather than just make an assumption, there's an intrinsic risk that you're jumping the gun. And therefore, these are traps that are built into all these questions. So what I'm getting at is what may potentially look indolent at the start could actually end up being quite a difficult question and cause issues unless someone's aware of them. Yeah. Um, and it's a bit mean to ask these for 17 year olds, isn't it? <laughs> That's why you need to practice. But, but this is it, right? Like the quality of students and the applicants over the last few years has increased so much. So I was in the I was in the garden a few years ago and they, they love sound bites, right? The Guardian. So the one they, they the one they got from me was uh, when there's a pandemic when there's a war, everyone wants to be a hero, but when there's a pandemic, everyone wants to be a doctor. And it's, it's so true, like last year we saw a 20% increase in medics, the year before it was a similar amount as well. So obviously as spaces go up, uh, sorry, spaces stay the same, but applicants, applications go up, yeah. competition, it gets harder and harder. So they do have to push these students more, um, which is, yeah, um, poor 17 year olds. <laughs> um, so any, any tips you'd like to kind of share some with, the, with anyone who may have an interview coming up? Yeah, so, you know, definitely do be sure to revisit your personal statement, because <clears throat> I think when you're writing it, you think, right, this detail, um, it's etched in my memory, I'm never going to forget this. Mm. And then there's time between when you submit the personal statement and when you have your interviews. 
and if you're not refreshed some things can you know catch you off guard so just make sure that you're doing that um and also make sure that you understand what the question is asking of you um and if you don't don't be afraid to clarify in mm. that moment don't you know don't just rush in and answer a question based on what you think is being communicated but make sure that you are sure and i would say also just relax you know take your time take a breath mm. um don't feel that you need to be rushed you have the time and you have the space and actually i would imagine that that's what they're looking for from you they're looking for a considered response not just a knee jerk reaction because that's going to be the better response yeah yeah absolutely that, that, i think that second thing is so important and it's just so overlooked and it's really good advice which is if something's even remotely unclear then just clarify with the interviewers they'll be very grateful and often they'll give you more details about what exactly they're after um so, so that that is just very 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 good advice um and yeah matt's helpfully written donor <laughs> unfortunately and you know it, it is it is a good point which is you are talking to admissions tutors who have done this and interviewed hundreds of students before so if they do sense and if you are lying and you're not able to hide it perfectly they will find out and particularly you know, in any career you shouldn't be lying but particularly in medicine it's a complete learn no no so doctors just should not lie whatsoever under any circumstances um like obviously there's professional integrity involved so that's obviously very very key as well um okay um uh, getting towards the end of it so so man we've talked a lot about what the what students have to look forward to when, when it comes to their interviews and the challenges of them um how can how can we help how can we kind of help with them so um we have designed programs of support for students who find themselves in that position where they you know they want to go in the direction of medicine or engineering these these pretty difficult subjects you know at these top universities and they're at the stage in their life where they're thinking okay how best can I get the results that I want to, to achieve um, so our programs are designed to help you fulfill your potential with regards to this and to give you all the time all the space and the support that you need to get this done so um, we have programs of support and they outwork themselves through mainly four components so I'll just go into those mm -hmm. the first is one-to-one -one tuition okay so we we team you up with somebody who has done your subject and who has gone to your university of choice and most importantly somebody who's achieved in the top 10 percent of their own admissions process and um you liaise with them and you partner with them and it's designed to cover you know personal statement any admissions tests you may need and the interview process so the whole application cycle which is really important you know because if you imagine if you come to us in the middle of the cycle we can help you for instance with maybe the admissions tests and the interviews but ideally what we want to do is work with you for the whole duration so mm -hmm. at least 12 months plus um you know perfecting that personal statement all the way through to when you get that offer yep. okay um also i should mention that after each tutorial you get a report card and that's sent to you the student and also your parent or guardian it's a summary of what you've done within the tutorial and also for any recommendations that the tutor may have for you pertaining to um any homework or any independent independent study that you can do um or any wider reading that has come up from um the tutorial Uh, we also do something called um, our intensive day courses. So uh, these happen usually over the course of a weekend. So it's 11 hours worth of content. And these are important. They happen before your real life deadlines. So, you know, just before you're going to take your admissions tests or just before your interviews. They serve to help us to know that we have done our job, that you have retained that information that you've been given. Um, but also it should be a real boost for you 
to mm. know that you can go into that BMAT or that UCAT and you're, you're going to do well because you've been doing well before in those practice scenarios. Um, and, you, you know, that's you can't beat that, really. Yeah, you want to yeah. feel that sense of confidence. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we also have something called a cooling off period. Um, and this is, it's to make sure that everybody involved is on the same page. So, you know, that you as the student, you're happy, your parents are happy, and that we are happy with your level of engagement. So it's a way of testing all of the elements of our programs so that there's cohesion there. And also, if there was anything that you wanted changing or adapting, then you would flag it in this time period and we would do our best to, to satisfy those changes. Um, so if you're entering for 2022, then the cooling off period is five days. If entry for 2023, it's 14 days, so a little bit longer. Yeah, and I think the, the key point to mention here is it's obviously there to help you make sure it's a good fit for you, but it's also a chance for us to make sure it's a good fit for the students. So if the students just completely ignoring the program, not turning up to their sessions, not doing the seminars, then ultimately we don't want that. Mean, and that, I don't mean that in a kind of mean way, but we have to be very protective of our success rate. So um, our success stats are probably the, the key thing that distinguishes us and what we're very proud of. So last year, I think we got two thirds of our students in, obviously for the previous collection, we're still waiting on data to come in with the Cambridge students, but we want every year for those numbers to go up rather than down. So if students aren't engaging, then those numbers are realistically going to go down. So we will have a you know, open, honest conversation, say that this isn't quite working for us, here is what we need from you. And if it doesn't work, then we refund everyone. Yeah. Fully because we have yeah. to it's just not what we don't want are unhappy students and unhappy parents like we want essentially the only the, the super keen super committed and the ones who are going to do all the work we tell them to because we can only take you so far we can only give you the textbooks resources and tell you here's the things you should be doing ultimately you have to do it and, exactly and, exactly and, so it's really important we provide that structure yeah. and that framework um, but as you can imagine, the students are pivotal to everything that we do and feed back into our success rates. So, yes, you know, the equation has got to work together. You've got to do your bit and we do our bit and then everybody's happy. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. And you're very welcome to have a look at our Trustpilot reviews. So we've, it's a very, very good day because we've had another one today. Um, if Will was here, Matt, Matt and Will often have this game where they talk about how few reviews Matt, Will has, but have you ended up on the <laughs> yet, Simone? <laughs> Actually, maybe I'm there. Maybe I'm famous. Might, I just didn't know yeah, it. you might be. Yeah. So, but, <laughs> but if uh, if anyone fancies making Simone stay, then uh, please do. That would it. really make my day. Then uh, please do leave a review <laughs> if you found these, these sessions useful. Uh, oh. and particularly, make sure to mention Simone. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, okay. So, and last year uh, we're still waiting on the foundation numbers to be clarified, but I think. We just about, I think we, we ended up at about 200 students completely uh, that we supported through our foundation last year. Um, so this is, this is quite important, which is for every paying student we have, we want to essentially get to a, a situation where we have the same number of students completely for free. So every paying client subsidizes our foundation kids completely free of, so that they can have the same support completely free of charge. Um, so. We've come a long way. We did just about 100 in 2020, double that last year, and we want to continue to try and double that. We were aiming for a one-to-one -one target, obviously, depends on how last year went, but we won't be far off it if, if things continue this way. Um, okay, and then this is my shameless plug time now, so, <laughs> uh, which is if you, uh, if you enjoy listening to, to, to me or uh, enjoyed listening to um, one of our other open day experts, uh, Will, then we have uh, launched a podcast where you can listen to us talking more about Oxford admissions, or actually, if you'd like us to hear our thoughts on more unusual topics like Will's zombie plan or my view on flat earthers, then uh, we've recently done episodes on those. So that can be found on Spotify and it's called the Two Blues Podcast. Um, okay, well, that kind of brings us to the end of the, the form, formulaic uh, bit of the, the presentation. Uh, this this uh, little video is going to run and just allow students to uh, or show them how to book a consult consultation with us and 
obviously we're going to start taking questions now and we'll do our best to give as much detail as we can but please understand that if you are applying for um north uh, I don't even know, manchester medical school with a ucat of 680 and 7a star the gcse it's going to take us some time to essentially give you an estimate of what your chances are or answer some very specific questions so often students will say things like what are my chances of getting an interview and the short answer to that is well we need to ask you about another 15 questions and we unfortunately can't do that here so, <laughs> uh, if you do have questions and please um you know, fill them in here but don't take it person if we say please book a consultation with you because we do just need a lot more information from you so Regardless, if you're interested in finding out more about our programs or if you just like some more information about your application and what you should be doing, then please do book in a consultation as you are being shown here. And we'll, uh, we'll start taking, taking questions, I guess, now, Simone. I think that would be good. Fine. Okay, great. So we've got, uh, we've got one from Gina uh, who says, we're looking for 2024 entry. So, not, uh, so they're not applying this year, they're applying next year. Um, how soon should my child start preparing? What a great question. Yeah, really good. Um, so that would mean the child was in year 11, is that correct? Yeah. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah, so now is a perfect time. So we have um, different support programs for different age groups. Um, and actually we have something called the Head Start program, um, which would work perfectly for, for your child who's in year 11. And it, it's all about, you know, upskilling um, your, your child so that they work smarter um, and so that they know exactly what to expect when they get to, you know, doing the application cycle in earnest. So what we would recommend is that you do the Head Start program in year 11, and then in year 12, you can start the program that really focuses on the application. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so then why should someone start with us now rather than next year? I mean, if they're in year 11, they've got two years left, why now or why not do it next year? Um, so I would say that that is based on the fact that if so many things are converging all at the same time, what you want to do ideally is give yourself space and time to learn and to grow consistently. You were talking about the, the soft skills and you were talking about different aspects of the application cycle. And the fact is the best students, the ones that do really, really well, partner with us for almost two years. So, you know, we... I'm not saying that, you know, we have a formula and we have an equation. We know it works. We're getting the results. Um, so it's a case of that partnership and, you know, and trusting that partnership. But definitely start now as opposed to just leaving it off because you're going to feel stressed later on in the in the time. Does that make sense? You're going to feel stressed. More stressed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that, you know, it's just purely numerically, they have roughly a 60% chance of the start with us 12 months. They have almost an eighty percent chance of getting in. Start two plus years with us. So, yeah, some students don't need it, and again, it's very difficult to say when they'd be a good fit for. for uh, it's very difficult to say when exactly someone should start, but generally, earlier the better. Yeah. In, in our experience, but you know, it depends on the students. Please just get in touch with us, and we'll be happy to advise. Um, Briar asks, "What's the best way to prepare for the UCAT?" Um, this is a, it's a really good question. The UCAT, I would say, you need to start preparing early for it. Um, how early really depends on the student and their kind of aptitude. Um, so, for example, if, they've, if they're used to things like doing like 11 plus tests, then they'll naturally be a bit better at UCAT style questions than if they've never taken any nonverbal reasoning or verbal reasoning tests in, in their life, for instance. Um, Generally, the good, the best idea is to get hold of a question bank or a textbook and kind of start working through that from the start and then start topping that up with one-to-one -one teaching. Again, it depends on the student and what they're aiming for. If, if they're aiming instead for Oxbridge and UCL and Imperial, one of the London medical universities in the UK is as important, then we would structure their preparation accordingly so there's more to tailor towards the BMAT. If the goal is somewhere like King's, which requires an absurdly high UCAT, then that's what we need to start focusing on instead. So the, the first thing to do is to get, do a full test, get a baseline of how, you know, which part of each section are you, are you working, uh, are you doing well in, 
they're not doing well in. So generally, most students will have sections that they're pretty good in and, generally, and other students will have sections that they're poor in. And then what we try, we try and do is work on the students' weaknesses and keep working on them until they become a strength and worry about the other sections which are less strong. So it's always try and work on your weaknesses. Um, okay, so uh, anonymous attendee says, this is lovely. So glad these sessions are back. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. we're, we're, glad, we're glad to be back too. Um, uh, we've got, uh, is it all applicants are invited for interviews or can someone get a place for Cambridge without having an interview? So yes, um, for medicine and anything for Oxford and Cambridge, you can, well, you have to have an interview. Well, I used to say you have to. So there was a, about two years ago, there was an instance when, when COVID was first really kicking off. I think it was Pembroke College made an offer for natural sciences without an interview, which was just unheard of. Um, but that was, I think, six or two or three students out of thousands. So yes, generally, if you're applying to Oxford, <laughs> school, you need an interview. Like, you won't get through with that one. Um, Okay, Simone, um, we've got someone who says, how long is too long in taking time to think about the question? In an interview setting, oh, that's, a, mm, that's interesting. Um, well, I think, you know, if, if the room just grows silent, um, <laughs> <laughs> awkwardly, that might be a little bit too long. Um, but if it's just, you know, you're gonna pause, breathe for a few seconds, then I think that that's acceptable. I think it also depends on the complexity of the question, doesn't it? Like if they say, why medicine? And you're like, well, can I have a moment to think about that, please? I think that'd be a bit odd. <laughs> um, because it's just, like, <laughs> You should know it? that, yeah. Yeah, whereas if they say something like, how many ping pong balls are there in this room or could be fit into a, a Boeing 747, then it's, I think it's very fair to say, can I have a, a moment to think about that? Yeah. Um, I think probably the longest you could ask for a pause would probably be about, Two minutes would probably, I mean, two minutes doesn't sound like a lot, but I think in, in reality- Two minutes does sound like a lot. That's a, that's a lot of like time, <laughs> just dead time. <laughs> yeah, just you staring at- <laughs> <laughs> It's quite a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's definitely the top end. Okay. Normally I think most most admissions tutors and interviewers won't mind if you kind of take 30 seconds out, kind of cogitate and present a coherent answer. Cool. But a, a good question to ask. Okay, great. Um, What's the difference? What we got? got quite a lot of specific medical questions. Um, will they ask questions from our personal statement? Yeah, I think they will. Um, they definitely will touch on the things that you have um, referred to in your personal statement because they're trying to get a better sense of you as a person, and sometimes that's difficult to do you know, with just, you know, ink on paper, as it were. Um, you're there in person, so you can bring to life what you spoke of in your personal statement. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think they will, essentially, not all admissions tutors will have read your personal statement. It's also worth keeping in mind. So, but if they have read it, they won't have read it from start to finish. They'll kind of just look for keywords. I mean, I, I can say this because I've interviewed for med schools. And... That's generally tends to be, you know, often they won't have analyzed your statement for hours or be like a five, 10 minute job before the interview is meant to start. And they'll kind of say, here, here are the, the key thing, like tell me about Duke of Edinburgh or something. Um, but yes, anything on your personal statement is very much fair game. So please, again, we've talked about this, but don't lie on your personal statement. Yeah. If you have lied, do everything you can to make it a truth. Um, because that, particularly if you're applying for medicine, probity is just such a big thing. So you shouldn't be having to do that. Okay, um, let's see here. How do I decide on a fifth option? So medics can only apply for four. Remember that you can add on a fifth option at any time. I mean, ideally you add it on before the 15th of Jan when the UCAS deadline is, but you can, there's nothing stopping you from adding on later point. Our general thing is, well, I only apply for if you're actually going to take it because if you apply for something like biomedicine, and you're definitely not interested in a biomedical degree. It's just no point. It's just, uh, you're just wasting time essentially. So if you're definitely keen, committed, 100%, if you get rejected from medicine, you would go for medicine again. 
then just leave it blank. If happily you take a degree in pharmacy or biomedicine or another option, then consider that. But generally what we say is try and get it in before the 15th. But if you haven't now, then I would just say leave it blank until you start finding out from your medical schools, because hopefully, fingers crossed, you won't have to worry about a fifth choice because you'll have two offers from med school. Um, okay. Do what else we got? Um, we've got someone saying thank you very much. Very great. Well, thank you very much for your thank you. Uh, <laughs> so we've got one chap who's asked anonymous attendee for the role plays within the MMIs. How could you prepare for them? Would they give you a scenario of what will happen in the role play? Would it be that actually you just go in blind and have to react as you'd be expected to? Yeah, so that's a that's a good question. Yeah. Often what will happen is sometimes med schools will say to you, here's a role play that you're going to get and they'll give you a bit of time to prepare for it before the interview day itself. Normally what happens is you'll have like one minute or two minutes of reading time and you'll, you'll kind of sit outside the station and they'll give you a brief like, I think the most common one that uh, you'll, you'll probably find this quite funny, Simone, is um, you've just run over your neighbor's cat. Oh, no. And then you have to kind of break the bad news to them. Oh, it's a bad day at the office. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and you, so you see, you know what you're going to have to do, and you kind of have a minute to think about it, and then you go into the actual conversation. The different medical schools will do it differently, but very few will kind of say you, you, you go and see the role play actor and they'll say tell me I'm going to die like it doesn't work that way like you'll okay. get given a brief and then you kind of work off that brief itself um okay if the applicant doesn't receive a letter for an interview does that mean the candidate's not successful Simone what do you think if they don't receive a letter with an invite to be interviewed well yeah, so if they've, if they've not had a letter yet saying you're invited is that I mean, is no news good news or bad news? Well, it, it depends when that particular university usually does the interview. So mm. it may just be that, you know, they don't contact people yet. Mm. Um, if they do their interview, say, for instance, in March, then, you know, you, you're not going to be notified in January because, as I mentioned earlier, usually they give you a few a few days notice. So mm. um, it might not be the time to panic, but it, it just depends. Obviously, if you apply to a university and they usually do their interviews in January and you've not been notified, then. You know, yeah, so I think the, the general rule, just to keep things really simple, is if you've not heard by the end of March, mid-April, then you've probably unfortunately been unsuccessful. Most medical schools will have finished their interviews by the end of March. Okay, uh, got a few more thank yous. You're very welcome. Um, so we've got some questions on what's the what's the best what are the best questions or most likely questions are that to come up in a medical school interview. So the three most common questions are why medicine, why this university. And then probably where do you see yourself in the next five years or 10 years, probably 10 years time? Um, those tend to be the most common ones. We do have a, a medical school interview guide uh, book that I wrote a few years ago. Um, that's got the top 100 questions that get asked in medical school interviews. So it's worth picking up a copy just to kind of get a better understanding of it. If you're interested in one of our programs and please don't pick up a copy because we'll provide it for you uh, to save yourself some money that way. Um, but those three question i think why medicine and why this university you should just have down and rehearsed very very well because essential they do come up um you know, any specific concrete guidance or any tips about mmis would be greatly appreciated any anything else you know? any anything any new nuggets that you kind of like to add on um no i think just again you know make sure that you pace yourself there's going to be a lot going on in that room so you know don't focus on that just focus on what you have to do at hand um take your time make sure that you you know what's expected of you at each station as you, if you go to a, a station and there's nothing there but a piece of paper as very had said earlier don't freak out it's okay it's supposed to be that way um, yeah and, and then the other, the other thing is that don't walk out of the interview think when you get to number 10 let's say if there's 10 stations when you get to number 10 don't walk out because if you have not started on number one, you could end up missing half the interview. And this actually happened to one once oh. a few years ago, which was he <laughs> he got to the end and then he was like, 
I'm done now. And actually, you still have three or four stations. So oh, when you get to number 10, you go back to number one, uh, which I know sounds really, really daft, but it is true. <laughs> it does happen. So, um, yeah, just the practical stuff. And you know, if you have a, if you have a rest station, have some cookies and enjoy your tea. Yeah, use it. Use it. Uh, okay. We've done the most likely questions as well. Um, are all medical school interviews online this year? Not, not all of them, but I think the majority of them are, are online this year. Some are still doing MMI style, whereas the majority seem to have moved to a panel style interview just because logistically and operationally, it's much easier for them to do arrange two interviews rather than trying to arrange 10 different interviews on 10 different Zoom channels, for example. Um, obviously, guidance up changes pretty regularly. Um, so the best thing to do is to uh, go onto the university's website and often they'll tell you like this is going to be the format of your interview etc um so man we've got a question here how do we how do we manage the students workload in year 12 given that they're going to have mock interviews bma ucap preparation personal statement work experience like how does that all work yes it does sound like um a lot but planning is going to be key to that equation that's the first thing and you know if you imagine there's a big jump between um doing your a levels in year 12 and doing your a levels in year 13 so much better to be you know focusing on the application process in year 12 when you've got a bit more space and time than you know in the second year of a levels when things become particularly intense um, so again, about planning, which we basically deal with on our programs, we give you the structure, we give you the support, we give you the materials, we give you the tuition. Um, so there's so much less for you to worry about. And actually, our programs really help to supplement what you're doing already at a level. Um, you know, it's a case of you don't have to be divided. Um, it really complements what you're already doing um, and gives you that extra support and gives you that extra strength. Um, so that's how planning a great yeah. program. Yeah, and I think sometimes students can say, oh, it's so much work and that. And yeah, it is. But, you know, if you're applying for medical school, that's going to be a lot of work too. So, and it's going to be, I, I assure you, it's going to be a lot more work than you've done ever in your life. And I, when I was when I was applying, I did yes, I worked reasonably hard, but nowhere near the levels I worked in medical school. So, if hard work is scary, and you think you'll struggle to manage everything, then yeah, it's worth considering whether medical career will be a good fit for you. And, and and again, I don't mean that in a malicious manner. I just mean that as a, it is really hard being a doctor. It's really hard studying to be a doctor. And what you don't want to do is to adjust and optimize your application, but actually find that it's not a career that's going to be a good fit for you long term because that's what it is, right? So it's a career you're applying for, not just a degree. Yeah. Um, we've got Gina again saying, we're at an American school doing the AP curriculum. My child will read IB biology higher level and she's very interested in, anat in anatomy. The UK universities accept mixed curriculum at high school. Um, she's going to be reading AP chemistry and IB biology all at one sitting seating at year 12 at uh, year 13 wow okay right so this probably br broadly falls into what we were talking about which is we probably need to ask you gina we 10 15 more questions in order to get a better understanding of which university which courses um what are the qualifications your uh, your child has and then we'll be able to kind of get a better understanding um each university deals with these things differently and it depends on the course that you're applying to as well so the best thing here is to book in a consultation with us and we'll be able to help you out more. Um, my video says, my son's a Caribbean student who's excellent grades, very good, and sat his lower six and upper six exams during the pandemic and was still able to work and volunteer and that's his overall portfolio is great. This is sounding positive. <laughs> However, he had technical difficulties with admission testing and holistic evaluation was not looked at as 2022 entry. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Are all international students not treated the same? It depends on the university. Um, some universities will prefer students from certain parts of the world. Um, often they won't share that information with us. Generally, you should be on the same footing as other internationals, but international for medicine in particular is incredibly competitive. Again, we need to ask you 10, 15 questions to get a better understanding of what exactly the circumstances are. 
So please, uh, it looks like she's already mentioned that she's going to book in a consultation. So we look forward to speaking with you later, Vivian. Um, okay. Please do keep your questions coming in. We will get through them. And then I think we should probably start wrapping up um, reasonably soon as well. Um, any questions that catch your eye, Simone? Uh, so we've got one from anonymous attendee. Do you recommend any books for UCAT, BMAT? Well. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't quite know how to do this without plugging. <laughs> Plug your book. <laughs> uh, I'm going to try and remain as impartial as I can. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, we've got books which uh, I happen to have written, <laughs> 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 which were updated last year. But in all seriousness, um, books are really good for the UK and BMAT, and they're a great starting place. Um, we've got our own textbooks, which sold thousands of copies and are used by a lot of students every year. Um, it doesn't really matter which textbook, because particularly for the BMAT, because there's just so many past papers available, the, the important thing to remember is the books can't actually talk back at you and actually point out where your areas of weaknesses are. That's when you need like more active teaching, essentially. Um, so you need missions have a book called the UK Collection and the BMAT Collection. Those are great starting places. There are other textbooks in the market which um, you're very welcome to kind of go browse as well. Best place to get started is just go onto Amazon and type in UCAT and BMAT books, and there'll be quite a few. Ours is on top, but I'll let, you make that, I'll let you find that out at the same time. Um, great. Uh, what else have we got? So is it common for students to do more than one medical cycle? Um, is this okay? Um, I probably just need to understand what medical cycle means because it, it can mean quite a few things. If you mean, is it okay to reapply as a medic? Um, then yes, that's absolutely fine. And can, actually we have some very good success stories where students didn't get in the first time, but then came back to us and did have a very good run at it the second time and got a place. Um, okay. And then what is the difference between PBL, CBL, integrated. The best place to kind of go through this in more detail is we actually have a really good like um, article on this on our website. Very briefly, there's three major types of teaching. There's the, the kind of um, traditional, which is you do all your sciences in the first two or three years and then you do the clinical aspect. Uh, so that's typically what Oxford and Cambridge do. And then there's the integrated, which is a systems-based approach where it'll teach you everything to do with the lungs. So you learn about lung anatomy, lung physiology, uh, and then followed by lung pathology. So everything that, how do, how do the lungs work? Why, what, what are the lungs actually made of? What do they consist of? And then what goes wrong with the lungs? And then you kind of do that on a system basis. And PBL is more, this patient comes in coughing, what could be wrong with them? And then obviously it could be lung problems, but it could be heart problems and so on. So there's different styles of teaching. They work for different people. Ultimately, regardless of which medical school you end up going to, all of these differences eventually get standardized and corrected and normalized out by the time you become a doctor. Anyway, That's the key thing is if you are applying for medicine, you're going to be a doctor assuming you get a place in med school. So that's just something to keep in mind. Okay, so I think we'll start wrapping up now, Simone. Uh, if you do have any last minute questions, we're happy to take them. Otherwise, we'll see you in a, in a fortnight. Any, uh, any last minute uh, kind of tips for students that may have their interviews coming up over the next few weeks, Simone? Yes, you know, project, breathe, um, think about what is being asked of you and put your best foot forward. Be confident. Um, you know, don't underestimate your ability. Don't undersell yourself. It's your last moment to shine. So yeah. really use it. Yeah, and, and, and we've not talked about the, the impact of Zoom or online interviews, but most interviews nowadays online. Um, so please take the time to make sure that your background is neutral. There's nothing kind of strange or distracting in the, in the background. Make sure that you're well dressed, there's no distractions for yourself, that you've got a clear background, make sure your internet's absolutely fine. Just all those really boring logistical things, but they make yeah. a difference. You just want to be completely zen <laughs> the, the, <laughs> on the time of the internet itself. 
Well, uh, so that kind of ties everything together quite nicely. Uh, hopefully, everyone, you've had a you've had a good time and enjoyed learning lots about medical school interview. Um, next time, we're going to be talking about and focusing on the 2023 applicants. Um, so thank you very much for attending and thank you for co-hosting with me, Simone. It's been fun. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you. you for everybody that's joined with us. Thank you. You're very welcome. And thank you very much for all the, the, the well wishes. And we look forward to speaking some, to some of you in our consultations uh, later this weekend and early next week. Have a, have a great weekend, everyone.